Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has the effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have with me Kevin Long from the longview.com.au. Now, Kevin from Australia has offered his quarterly website forecasting service since 2008 for farmers as a community service to help people navigate their way through cyclical, non-carbon dioxide climate change in southeastern Australia Specific area on the planet, Kevin's based in Bendingo, Victoria, and he offers weather commentary for Murray Darling Basin. But as well as that, what they also do is back in the early period, whenever they saw an extreme hot day, they say, well, that day can't be right. We'll have to replace that bit of information with another weather station and use the information from another weather station and slot it in. So what they're actually doing is taking the peak temperatures out of the early part of our temperature records and replacing it with lower figures to enhance the uh, upward climb of temperature from 1910 to present. You might realise that 1910 was the bottom of the 60-year heat cycle. Heat cycle peaks 1880, 1940 and 2000 and in between each one of those you have about a 0.2 of degree lower temperatures occurring. When you get Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus together or you get Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune together, uh, these planetary movements create a little rise in the world's temperature whenever you get a concentration of planets in one sector of planetary system. Yeah, that's right. And Theodore Landscheid had mapped that out. And again, when we come to 2023 and 2024, we get into that quadrant out there where all four of the gas giants are directly in front of the Earth. What that is doing is moving the uh, sun yeah, off absolutely. the center of the barrier center. So the barrier centre then moves outside the diameter of the sun. And that, that causes the sun to go into solar minimum periods. Yeah, you'd have to see the diagrams to understand that. It's more like you're looking at the sun, and if you have a stencil graph, the way it moves around uh, above and, and below and off that actual centre point, that would be literally the centre of the sun and the centre of the sky as you look at it in view. It might spark the seed for somebody to do some of their own research because that's kind of what the point of these interviews are is, yeah, I can bring you some information here, but you should be doing some of your own research to really follow up and, and find is what we're talking about true or not true. I mean, the IPCC has told you it's been warming and it's all CO2 and it's man influence and we're warming the planet, but we're giving you an entirely different data set over here saying, hey, this is completely something other than CO2 happening on our planet with extraterrestrial, if you will, off the Earth. We have the sun, we have the planets, there's uh, electromagnetism, Birkeland currents. We have all these things happening that also affect our weather systems, our jet streams, and it's not all CO2. You know, Kevin, I had a quick question for you. The Madden-Julian okay. Oscillation, I'm not really too familiar with this one. It starts off over near the Horn of Africa, and it travels under India and, and cross through New Guinea and out into the Pacific Ocean. It does this on about a six-week period. And when this Madden-Julian Oscillation is travelling just through New Guinea and slightly east of Australia, it has the ability to raise the moisture content over that area and then that gets flushed into Australia. So when the Madden-Julian Oscillation map is divided into eight sectors, so we, we find in eastern Australia we get a, about 25% of our rain uh, when it's in phase one and about 60% or so when it's in phase five. And the other phases are not very productive in, in rain. So it's just another little assistance, you know, that works and when it's in the right place. When you look at longer term durations too, the intertropical convergent zone moves north or south in these grand solar minimums. So you can also imagine some of these other, what this Madden-Julian oscillation might also be fluctuating more north or more south as the intertropical That's convergence zone itself moves more north or more south. The moisture records are very clear, yeah. you know, looking at the stalactite core samples after you slice those open like tree rings. I mean, it's very clear that those moisture patterns move. We have um, mega droughts in Australia that they've been recorded uh, throughout history in tree rings and in trees 
that have grown in the bottom of rivers and they've grown in the bottom of lakes. And these trees have grown for 60 or 70 years at a time without ever being killed by a flood or water. Now, uh, not very far away from where I've lived all my life, there's a 40-foot deep lake, a mile in diameter, has no outflow. It can only dry out by long periods of low rainfall. And in the bottom of that lake are many tree stumps which are nearly a metre in diameter. And one would have to say, well, it must have been very, very dry to, dry to grow trees like that in those lakes. Now, I believe that's the type of cycle that we're facing over the next 20, 30, 60 years because they seem to occur when we have a solar mineral cycle. When we have that, we get greater levels of sea ice around Antarctica, and when we get greater levels of sea ice, we get dry air moving into Australia, and our rain systems basically shut down. When we're doing forecasting, especially my whole crux on the bringing the information of the grand solar minimum is our crops are going to be affected. So think about that. If Australian production is affected, South American production is affected, and South African production is affected, those are exporters to other nations. So if they can't export those tens of millions of tons, where are we going to, or where are those other countries that are used to getting those exports from Australia or from South Africa, where are they going to in turn get that from another place? Because the United States is going down in production. Canada's down. China's down. So where's the rest of the draw going to come from? This is what makes no sense to me with the USDA calling 40 million tons down on the carryover stock already. And it's like, wait a second, I thought it was supposed to be a good harvest, but they're already calling 40 million ton drawdown. What? Where'd that come from? So I don't know where the push and pull is going to come from on the supply side going into the future. Maybe not this year, but what you're talking about, prolonged drought. My area of uh, Victoria here in the 1970s had its wettest decade ever at 627 millimetres average. The next decade, the 1980s, was 572. The next decade was 536. And the decade 2000-2009 was 418. So we've lost long term a third of our rainfall within 30, 40 years. The rainfall this year in most Murray Basin is well below it any of those any period of that time so coming back to the local area where you're at there are the local farmers talking about this do they understand the mechanisms or what's causing these cycles of wetter climate and drier cycle they're saying they're bum up in the air and they hope for rain they are the internal optimists and some of my clients are saying please don't send me any more bad news <laughs> Our local ABC radio will not have me on the radio. I used to do a program like, like we're doing now, a talk with our local ABC best announcer that I think I've ever seen in Australia, Jonathan Rignall, and uh, yet when I started talking about global cooling and a mega drought coming, the message came down from up top. Please, do not have Kevin on anymore. We don't want to have any more of that message. In your opinion, what do you think the reason is for this? and take it the next step further. That's the whole thing. I can't get it past a couple of steps. They want to keep pushing it further with the global taxes, etc. I understand that. But then what's the end move, though, at the very end there? What's their prize that they're trying to claim by pushing global warming in every single news outlet, even though it's cooling, and then try to pass global taxes? Every time I talk about sun cycles, I suddenly have a Wikipedia entry slammed under my video, guaranteeing you that I could be false news by talking about non-CO2 driving the climate, that there's other factors. As in lunar cycles and planet cycles and solar cycles. And sea ice cycles, right? Sea ice cycles are very powerful on our, our climate. And uh, what about all the aerosols that we're put, that's putting up in the atmosphere? I mean, what about Asia? Are you kidding me that China has no effect? You know, I'm singling out a nation, but I'm just going to say Asia in general. How much aerosol pollution's out of there? How much is coming out of the U.S.? The atmospheric pollution coming out of China and Asia, Indonesia, and that moving moving into the uh, areas north of New Guinea that was keeping that area warm like a little blanket and that was holding the monsoon season in the northern hemisphere longer than it would normally be. So hence we only have a monsoon season down here now of about three months long. The monsoon stays in the northern hemisphere for about nine months of the year. So that's why one of the reasons why we are having droughts in Queensland. And if that projects out and keeps going for the next decade, where does that take us? Queensland has, has up to seven years with low rainfall, but down here in Victoria, uh, 
it usually only lasts for one season at the peak of an El Nino event. And usually the year after an El Nino event it is a above average year. And we saw that in 2016. To longview.com.au, subscription service there. And again, uh, you can talk to Kevin directly if you're in that service. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Kevin. Great interview, and I'm so thankful that I had a chance to talk to you and share ideas. And I'll leave all the links below in the description box so you can go directly to the site. Goodbye, David. <laughs>